Hi, I'm Jack Barazzini, and you're listening to The Secret to Stargate, where you talk about the hidden meanings and deeper layers found in Stargate movies, TV series, and more. And joining me today are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father. Howdy, Jack. And Victor Lamb. Hey, Victor. Hi, Jack. Thanks for uh, filling in for me the past couple of weeks. I, I appreciate it. Oh, that. no problem. I've been letting our listeners know all your different exploits there, conducting medical research on wraith prisoners and <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and exactly. flying experimental governmental aircraft. It's, it's, it's been fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Today we are discussing the, uh, the eighth episode of season one of Atlantis underground. Atlantis seeks food from the Janai who pretend to be simple farmers, but they secretly have a military base and nuclear ambitions against the wraith. Both sides agree on an alliance, but they are both still distrustful of each other. The Janai want C4 to detonate their nuke while Atlantis offers to help against the Wraith. They infiltrate a Wraith ship, but they are discovered. Taylor's compassion leads to a Janai death, causing a rift. Returning, the Janai betray Atlantis, but they are outmaneuvered. Atlantis leaves with intel, revealing over 60 Wraith ships. i just like to refer to this episode as the uh, Cole Meany is very mean episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this episode, Father? Well, I went with the, the evil alternate Chief O'Brien. There we go. <laughs> alternate Universe Highly. Chief O'Brien. And by the way, he's, he's known as Chief Cohen. So, yeah. Cohen. Chief Cohen. Yeah. <laughs> so, I like this one. This is, you know, of course, we get the Janai who we see again. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of an ongoing thing throughout Atlantis. Um, I, I like that they actually did a, they, they kind of hinted at the beginning that there's something more to this fam, this, uh, this this pe- these people other than being you know uh, outer space Amish yep you know but um and then they pay it off actually fairly quickly and it, it's they I I I, lo- I think it's a good one it's another one of these of a species or a species a group of people that's they're behind us you know in this case about sixty years you know because they're back in you know the time of uh, World War Two type technology and and developing the nuclear the atomic bomb and all that and so but still a little bit. And of course, then they have to have a little bit of the newer technology where you see the computers and everything. So you get a little, little of both, but I've always liked this one. And Cole Meany always, he, I mean, he actually plays a much better bad guy than he does the nice <laughs> affable chief O'Brien. I like chief O'Brien. I like his acting in that, but he plays a good bad guy. He does. What about you, Victor? Yeah. I just have to echo everything that father Corey just said. Um, this is one of my favorites, uh, in Atlantis and therefore in the Stargate franchise, it does set up the Janai, which becomes my, my, one of my favorite, well, I think my favorite, like enemy frenemy, uh, Mm -hmm. type villains. As I mentioned last episode, I love it when they kind of show like a slightly behind us 20th century version of an alien. And we get that with the Janai. Um, one thing I caught this time that I didn't quite catch the other times I've watched this is that they used to be an interplanetary uh, civilization mm-hmm. before the Wraith wiped them out. So that may even be like pre or coexisting with Atlantis. But no, and then I, I would like all of that. And I love Jedi weapons. Like they're, we'll, we'll talk about like their their weapons and their guns. They're so cool looking. But I would like this episode even if Cole Meany wasn't in, in it. But as my favorite Star Trek actor, that just puts it over the top for me and and yeah, he he plays the the villain uh, so well in this. Yep. And I like that they are not like they're definitely antagonistic, but I don't even know if you could call them villains because their motivations for not trusting the Atlantis team really make a lot of sense. So <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah, even though like we're on we're on the side of the the point of view characters, obviously, but none of the actions that they took that negatively affected the Atlantis team were really like, Oh, they're just evil. Like within their framework of what they're dealing with, like pretty much everything they did make sense. Like they need that C4 to protect Mm -hmm. their civilization. Like you you get why they're doing what they're doing. Well, and and they were clearly upset and rightfully so to find out thinking, Oh, we've got another 50 to hundred years before the Wraith are going to, you know, start waking up. And all Mm -hmm. of a sudden, what do you mean? You just woke them up and they're already waking up now. Seriously. You know, (laughs) you know, so you can understand why they would be upset. Yeah. And, and I, what struck me this time watching it was um, chief Cohen's, reaction and the reaction of the Janai is pretty much what you would have expected from general Hammond and the SGC. Yeah. And that's in that situation. If they came upon a slightly more advanced 
alien species who was somewhat reluctant to share their technology, but you know, was, was see you know, the inter- Tolans. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So it was, yeah. And so, I mean, they quickly become enemies within the next, I think two episodes. Well, we get, we get the great Robert Davi yes. showing up yes. and he's awesome. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But even this is kind of skipping to the end, but even like the fact that they want one of the puddle jumpers, like that's I, makes sense to me, to be honest. Yeah. Reasonable. Yeah. 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 Well, and of course the funny part is all the, all the, all, uh, Shepard would have to do. Oh, sure. Here, why don't you, I'll show you how to fly it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't work mm. for you. Ah, oh, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless some of them had the ancient, uh, I mean, there's, they, yeah. they would have just yeah. as much chance to have the ancient gene as yeah. anybody else would have, but still that would be, that would be, that would have been a great scene too. Of like, Oh, you take the controls. Oh, it's shutting down. Huh? Guess we're going to crash now. <laughs> yeah. I, I do also think it's funny that throughout this episode, we get the reoccurring theme of Shepard either promising or <laughs> yes agreeing to things or stating things and not checking it off with weir and then oh. multiple times she's upset about it and it's that that it's, scene where it was shepherd and uh ford getting you know getting the wall to wall counseling session there and she's she's mad and they're just they're just smart alex yeah they're just they're just being sarcastic the whole time it's great yeah and, and we just saw this last <laughs> episode too where um well, I think it was uh, Beckett, you know, had promised to help the uh, the Hoffins with their virus yep. and stuff, right, without consulting her. And so in two episodes in a row, we get the, you know, kind of slightly behind Earth technology. The team in the field is promising something that, you know, Atlantis is in a unique position. They have to, they can't wait for orders from headquarters to, you yep. know, they have to negotiate in the field. And then coming back to Weir, who's very much not accustomed to that sort of negotiation happening and being like, Oh, so you promised them explosives. Oh, yeah. so you promised we, we, we'd help them build a nuclear bomb. You know? Yeah. And so that the way yeah. the escalation of that is very nice. Well, and that's, that's where we had the discussion about the uh, Geneva conventions, you know, I think yeah. giving nuclear weapons is kind of, or helping build nuclear weapons might be kind of a skirting the, the border on that too, you know? Does the Geneva convention even apply in space though? In that that was our discussion. <laughs> yeah. That was our yeah, discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we we came down on the side of it didn't, given that this was uh, you know, not on Earth, uh, in a different galaxy, and it's kind of a separate, you know, it's a colony. It's, yeah, yeah. There's a, extenuating circumstances there, but yeah, but, the writing the writing by uh, by Peter Deloise on this uh, his first episode that he wrote for Atlantis is mm-hmm. is excellent. There's a lot of really yes. good Rodney McKay humor. Oh, um, oh, he, yeah. he he built a he built an atomic atomic bomb replica in, in sixth grade for the science fair and got the CIA called on him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe and he was in Canada. <laughs> maybe he's the atomic boy scout. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to learn more about that, listen to Jimmy Aiken's mysterious world yeah. episode. I'll, I'll put it down there. There you go. Put it in the <laughs> show notes. In the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I love it. Cause you know, both of both shepherd shepherd was willing to give the weapons McKay was eager to give them the bomb mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. and then they try to, they, and they try to fight against each other, you know, like try to stop each other, but then they'd get hype up on, you know, and Ford's just going to sit there looking at him going like, okay. <laughs> McKay just wants food. Oh yeah. He, he wants his uh, Java beans, even though they're uh, Tava beans. Right. So Tava. Yep. Yeah. 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 He thought they were thinking coffee. It's like, no, <laughs> I may we get the- some nuclear weapons for coffee. Yeah. Um, we get the, the quintessential McKay moment in the opening where they're talking about how they need to find food, their coffee's running out, and they're like, it might help if people didn't drink like 11 cups a day. And McKay's just like, I just want to get my fair share before it's all gone. Well, it wasn't even Which people, was like, it was you. It was like yeah, pointing exactly. right at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to ration it out. Yeah. yeah. And I know we haven't had a, a lot of exploration of the Atlantis city yet, but they also have that whole continent that they could probably start growing food on. I assume they'd, they'd want to figure that out, but they don't even have a discussion of that. They, well, I thought they, the Athosians kind of talked about doing some of that, that they would, they would plant and, and eventually the food would, it was really brief. It was like one sentence yeah. when yeah, they, they did went mention, over to the. Yeah. That was going to be a while before any sort of harvest was was available from the mainland. And so they needed food like now. And so, uh, 
uh, you know, Taylor's working her network, um, mm-hmm. which is good. And, uh, you know, they go to Amish, Amish Paradise World. And, um, <laughs> I mean, you just look at this episode. They cover a lot in this episode. I, I think it was like eight or nine minutes in. They've already revealed that, you know, the um, Janai have like this underground civilization. And then a few minutes after that, they're helping them build an atomic bomb. And then a few minutes after that, they're storming a Wraith yeah. hive ship. So they 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 are just like moving in this episode. Well, even in in the stinger, I mean, it's like the last scene is the guy with this, you know, Dick Tracy watch. Oh yeah, I mean, and so okay, so these people aren't the the backwoods Amish they they pretend to be. Mm-hmm. We, and uh, to that to that note, we we do get uh, McKay's running kind of count of or tally of the amount of radiation he's been exposed to. He's very conscientious about that. We'll see in later episodes. Oh yeah, and so you know he's using his little HP IPAC PDA to, yep. uh, to, uh, to measure the amount of radiation there. And Cowan's like, uh, my scientists assure me it's safe. And um, <laughs> your scientists are wrong. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I do really like, uh, the aesthetic that they have going on mm-hmm. for the Janai. It's very, I don't know. What's the term? Like Adam punk, I guess would be, yeah. would be the word. Yeah. That you would yeah. Use. Um, like their computer screens are those big, like, weird tubes tube tv yeah. kind of thing yeah just, they're called like crts remember though <laughs> yes <laughs> but they look like the old school ones like the old you know 1950s ones where it was like the tube in a case and then the, yeah. the guts were in the box you know that's what they look like and i also like that we see that the janai have figured out how to access the memory yes. on the mm-hmm. darts and that Atlantis team is impressed by this rather than having it be, we have this memory module, but we can't get into it. And then McKay solving it in like five minutes. Like well, it's nice to see that they have the ability to do something like that too. Right. Well, the Atlantis team didn't even realize there were actually like a, a mother uh, or uh, the ships had, had mainframes that yeah. the ships actually had a computer system. And so they're like, wait, the Wraith, Wraith have computers. And of course, you know, immediately the wheels are spinning. It's like, okay, we need to get this data. Which of course they do at the end. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's also the first we see of like uh, McKay cutting into a wraith ship because they're you know living ships yep. made of organic matter to like open the door and stuff. Partly you know biomechanical, and yeah. given the the number of times we'll see them just kind of like stroll into a wraith hive ship and stroll out <laughs> in future yeah. episodes, it's kind of always nice to see the first uh, instance of that. Yep. Yeah, we're just kind of figuring it out. Yeah, I feel like that was a trope in mid 2000s sci-fi like the organic fleshy ships like i think you had that on farscape and battlestar yeah, Moya, yeah. Like, Lex. Far- farscape definitely yeah. kind of started that or not yeah it's kind of started it yep so tin man on uh star trek the next generation right so mm-hmm. yeah no it's a it's a big thing i think it's interesting that there's no like ruins on this planet of the advanced civilization because like you said, they used to be an interplanetary civilization, but as far as we see, they're living in dilapidated barns and farmhouses and Mm -hmm. things like that. Like you don't get any sort of above the surface evidence that they are anything more than. Yeah. Well, they they made it the village by design. Yeah. 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 They made it clear. It's like the, they first went into the bunkers, you know, centuries, millennia ago. And just started building from there. Mm-hmm. And so that's why there's nothing up top. It's all gone to anything that would have been there is, is, is all basically deteriorated to dust. Yeah. I guess, uh, I guess it's worked so far against the Wraith, but now that they have those nuclear signatures that causes an issue, which I kind of feel like the Wraith would be able to figure it out their way around that anyways, but whatever. How about getting completely incinerated by a, a nuclear bomb yeah. or just when they fly over the planet oh, detecting yeah the, detecting the, life signs well in the, the yeah, they did they did say that you know rf signals were being blocked yeah because they tried to use their radio and it didn't go through um but obviously radiation neutron radiation does does get through it's not lead yeah. shielded apparently i do find it interesting that they have the level of technology they have but they can't figure out how to make c4 or some sort of analog to it yeah, well, think of what our explosives looked like back in the 40s, though. They weren't anywhere near as concentrated as C4 is. True. You know, and, and again, if they're, they're, they probably didn't realize 
Because actually, it wasn't until Rodney told him either you have the C4 explosion mm -hmm. that packs the 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 fizzle material, mm -hmm. or you have the the gun. Because that was one of the ways is basically you shoot a shotgun shell into yeah. it and it goes right. boom. You know, and so and they didn't realize that until he said that. It's like, oh yeah, we, we did these two ways, we did this, we did this. It's like, oh, well, that just made our lives a lot easier. <laughs> And uh, we're also introduced to another character, uh, Sora, in this, played by Aaron Chambers, mm -hmm. who uh, we'll see again very soon. Um, and she has an additional reason to hate the Atlantis expedition to her father, yep. although it really looks like it could be her husband. But yeah, uh, you know, Tyrus uh, goes goes with the uh, Tyrus and Cohen goes with the Atlantis uh, crew aboard this uh, intelligence gathering mission aboard the Wraith Hive ship. And of course, they we get our first, well, one of our many eth ethical dilemmas in this where there are victims of the Wraith who have been cocooned, uh, kind of like a Wraith refrigerator, saving them for later. Yep. And of course, one of the victims wakes up. And if he looks familiar, it's because he's played by Darren Hurd, who was the the kind of the cancer patient in last episode, who was the first person to, who was the person that <laughs> Steve the Wraith <laughs> fed on. So he just can't catch a break. Nope. And uh, he wakes up. He's like, "Help me! I'm in co I'm in a cocoon." And and Tyrus shoots him. And of course, that wakes up the guards. And there's no alternative but for Taylor to leave. Uh, to and, wait, and of to course, leave Tyrus you behind. Know, yeah, Taylor taking him, you know, getting him out of the cocoon and taking him with them. That that would that alert the wraith. But shooting him multiple times, that definitely won't alert the wraith. <laughs> oh wait, yeah. it alerted the wraith, and he got shot. Yeah, and so now uh, now Sora hates the Atlanteans too, and we'll we'll see her again soon. Thank goodness. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I did see a funny piece of trivia. Uh, the actress, apparently, her husband's name is Carson McKay. So, oh, yeah. okay, which, yep. is, which is funny. You got Carson Beckett and Rodney McKay. So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I do love the Janai firearms because they look kind of like 1940s, almost Star Wars looking mm -hmm. blasters. Yeah. But you know, like they have these these potentially shotguns that have three barrels or grease guns or something. And they're, they yep. just look really cool. And then when we do see uh, them again, they, they have this, the main uh, Janai bad guy we see has this really cool looking pistol that I just, um, yeah, the, yeah, they're kind of, kind of Buck Rogers esque type. Yeah. Thing. But they could have been like, Oh yeah, I would totally believe that was like a 1940s, you know, East German pistol that I hadn't heard of before or something. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, their whole their whole design aesthetic is is cool. I even like their uniforms. Like yeah, they look like they put more thought into them than you often get. Like the off the shelf like generic sci fi military uniforms. Yeah. yeah. So we did see on um, on SG one recently kind of a similar thing. Uh, another civilization in the episode Icon where mm -hmm. the SG one team beams over and their presence starts a nuclear war or a horrible war. Uh, that, you know, wipes them out and Daniel Jackson is, you know, in a farm. And then, uh, but the uniforms in that, they basically just, they didn't make them special for the show. They were basically just like leftover Eastern European <laughs> uniforms. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, it's interesting to see like the amount of attention being paid to Atlantis versus SG-1 at this point. Mm -hmm. Although there are a lot of callbacks in this episode too. We get a call back to the other side. We get kind of this, you know, Last Supper motif where they're all around this this table in the bunker oh, sharing right. a meal, and that's very similar to the meal that they shared in Other Side, which was the episode that Rene Abergenois was in, where mm -hmm. they were helping the the space Nazis basically right. wipe out the undesirables and stuff. So it was a cool callback, I think, to that because we get our two Star Trek actors in each DS Nine yep. actors in each one. Uh, yeah, it's true. I like. Uh... I do like how when we first they have their first meal with them, which is their their harvest meal. And they're, yes. the country, they're like portrayed almost as just like bumpkins, and they got the yep. the moonshine they're drinking, and then you know later well, on they have like this super nice like fancy spread with the oh, red yeah. wine and everything. So, well, I, I love Taylor's response. Oh, we must have the, the harvest festival to celebrate, and Taylor's like, oh, yay. <laughs> and then, we get a and then later on, <laughs> yeah. later on, they're like, how many how many of those did we? put you through she's never again <laughs> <laughs> and we get the moonshine uh you know which is similar to um i think children of the gods the very first episode where the yep. 
the Abadosians give oh, uh, yeah. O'Neill some some moonshine or, or yep. something too. So, yeah, that was. <laughs> I mean, there are like sociological theories that, that alcohol uh, drives the development of civilization. So, well, but it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Just, just in moderation, of course. Yes, exactly. But yeah, um, I will say I, I want I want one of those flash drives that looked cool. Yeah, that did like a little spider. Yeah, with the LED sequencing on it. Yep. I did like how McKay asked if it was flash memory or a zip drive. That was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I missed the zip drive line. Oh yeah, man, so is oh, it flash memory too. or a zip drive? <laughs> yeah, which I feel like most people wouldn't even know what a zip drive is anymore. Yeah. Well, hey, I'll tell you what, those came out. It was first time I was in the Air Force, I was doing uh, basically IT. They call it work group manager, basically run, you know, doing desktop administration. Anytime we had to set up a new desktop, grab the zip drive, throw it in. There was all the software loaded up, ready to go. So those things were, those, those, those were the flash drives of the time. Yeah. And I'm sure they held a, a ton compared to, the floppies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, a hundred meg. Yeah, Woo-hoo. exactly. Uh, yep. Almost a hundred floppies on one of those discs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've never even actually used a zip drive, so I'm. Aging yeah. Myself there. Yeah. They, unfortunately, they weren't built very well and they wouldn't <laughs> last more than a couple of years before they got the click of death. Ah, uh, I mean, USB uh, flash memory has got the same issue, but. It's a little more hit or miss, but yeah, yeah. true. And uh, in this, we get the delicate dance again between like, will they or won't they tell the people that they're from Atlantis, you know, the lost city mm-hmm. of the ancients. Yeah. Um, it was an issue last episode where they, we thought they, they didn't, but then um, Perna tells uh, Dr. Beckett, like, I wanted to see Atlantis, but. Kind of her last words type. Yeah, yeah. It, it turns out not to matter whether or not they, they told them, mm-hmm. but uh but um, yeah, we got some really good episodes coming up very soon. Nice. Yeah. And I think just all the information that the Atlantis team withholds, like you've got mistrust on both sides from the very beginning. And that yep. kind of just sets up the whole domino effect where no one is, I would say no, neither side here really makes the best decisions in terms of forming an alliance moving forward, but you understand it. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, at the end of the episode, we learned that there are 60 hive ships uh, in the galaxy. Or more, which, 60 or, yeah, more, or, yeah. or more. Which seems like a really high number, um, you know, and that becomes kind of a driving a driving number throughout the rest of the, the first season. But it does kind of reflect back on last episode where they were bargaining with Steve the Wraith and saying, like, give us some intel, how many hive ships woke up? And he said, all of them. And that was really the, the, it didn't really quantify it. And now we finally get the yep. quantification that it's, it's 60 hive ships and plus all the cruisers and darts and stuff that uh, make up their support fleets and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the hive ships are the, like the ones we saw at the very beginning, right? Yeah. Yes. That look like okay. they're the size of a mountain, basically. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's got to make 60 nukes. Yeah, exactly. It works a couple times. <laughs> yeah. and then they adapt yeah pretty much oh, yes. and then it, of but, course at the end we have the we find out that sergeant bates was able to get some food but of course yes. it's not this isn't this isn't a competition which of course it absolutely is a competition with bates definitely yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't even see him in this episode which is kind of cool that he's he's just out there putting in he's the out there doing the work while shepherd's yeah. causing trouble yeah exactly did like a very first when Shepard first meets them, the very first thing that uh I can't remember the the Sora's uh dad Tyrus. says to him is like yeah. Tyrus, yeah. she's betrothed. Like, don't hit on my daughter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he's, he's like, like I wasn't, I too. swear. <laughs> yeah. She <laughs> must be very well. proud, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh did uh, did you all have any other uh thoughts on this episode? Nothing here. No, just that I, I really like it, and I like what they do with the Janai um, yep. going forward. One thing I will mention is that, uh, off topic to this, but uh, Joseph Malazzi just posted recently on X um, 
Baron Destructo on on X, mm-hmm. formerly Twitter. He he basically so we lost uh, Stargate Atlantis epi- after uh, season five, but he basically just posted a complete rundown of what season six would have looked like. Oh yeah, basically that's all right. of the all the high level treatments and and episode synopses for the twenty episodes or so yep. that would have made up season six. So, uh, yeah. you know, some of them are more fleshed out than others. I think Dial the Gate, uh, you know, did a good stream where they went through all of them. But mm-hmm. uh, definitely, if you're if you've already watched Atlantis through season five, and you want to know, hey, what what would season six have looked like if they'd gotten a season six? Check that out because there's some there's some really cool ideas in there. One of them was uh, not really fleshed out, but the entire team was trapped in hamster balls. Uh, and and couldn't escape their hamster balls individually, and they're in the path of the event horizon of the gate. So the next time the gate is dialed, they'll be vaporized. How do they get out of the hamster balls? Why are they in hamster balls? I think. Uh, but some, <laughs> some of the other ones are a little bit better than that. I, I wonder if that was a little bit more of a troll. But <laughs> no, nope, yeah, maybe, you never know. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, you look at it. Some of this, and yeah, some of these got full titles and full, you know basically looked like it was ready to be handed to a writer, say, write this episode. Yeah. And some of them are just like mid mid season, part one, mid season, part two, you know? Yeah. Just whatever the mid season cliffhanger episode would be two parter. But some of them, yes. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, so what you do now is you train an AI on Stargate and then you give it the, the treatments and ask it to flesh out the episode. (laughs) Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, Especially if someone could get a hold if someone could get a hold of like the season five Atlantis Bible. Yeah. And feed that to, cool. to open AI. Because that should have everything it needs in theory to at least have the characters and everything, characters and setting. Yeah. And even just being so familiar with the series, like just reading the treatments, I, I could kind of visualize like how that episode would have gone in my mind. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, what McKay would have said, you know, what you know, Shepard would have done. Like you, you can yep. kind of like say, "Oh yeah, yeah." That would. And it's kind of like, you know, eating mac and cheese. It's good comfort food. <laughs> all, all of that to say that Amazon has all sorts of resources there for them to tap into and bring back old, old uh, people who were working on the shows mm-hmm. before, and hopefully they'll actually take advantage of that. But I guess yeah, it's they- yet to be seen. They, yeah. they haven't put too much effort into actually trying to get Stargate going. It doesn't seem like they, every once in a while it kind of bubbles up a little bit. Oh yeah. The new season's coming. New season's coming. Oh, never mind. Yeah. Y- yeah. Um, he did something. This is way in our future here, but did, he did something similar for how they would have done a season three of Stargate universe or even a Stargate universe movie, which is what they were talking about at some point, mm. just to wrap things up after season two. Cause it did end on a cliffhanger. Right. Um, so some very good ideas too. So so he's been he's been uh, bringing the thunder on uh, on X, um, including some some oh, he's really got good, some great stuff. He yeah, puts alternate so much takes. Stuff out there. It's great. Of, yeah, if you ever want to see uh, Richard Dean Anderson and Christopher Judge juggle like they did in Window of Opportunity, but the extended kind of version of that, uh, he just posted yeah. that as well. So this is oh, nice. uh, yeah, I'm saying this as of you know June 9th. So you might yep. have to scroll back a little bit. To, yeah, definitely. He's a lot of fun to follow on there. Awesome. Uh, do we have any alternate language titles for this episode, Victor? Uh, not really. It was it was underground in most of them. Um, in French, we got uh, appearances, which is appearances, which is another good episode. And then uh, German just im Untergrund, which is underground. So ah, yeah, n- not not as good as some of the previous ones by we the had. Germans this time. I around. know. I know they were they were they were on a streak, but they just kind of ended it with that. So, mm. ah well, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Before we go, we would like to take a moment uh, to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secret to Stargate, and their generous donations at sqpn.com/give make it possible for us to continue the secret to Stargate and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com/give. Be sure to follow the show on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and you can find the video versions at youtube.com slash starquestmedia. That seems like it's definitely uh, the place to be with uh, interaction. We get, we get lots of good comments on there, and we always appreciate that. Yay, comments. Yay. <laughs> and to find previous episodes of Secret to Stargate and to send us feedback, you can visit sqpn.com slash stargate. You can email us at stargate at sqpn.com, 
or follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia or on X at SQPN. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next episode of SG-1, Covenant. Until then, Father Corey, thank you for joining me and sharing the secret to Stargate. Thank you, Jack. And Victor Lambs, thank you as well. Thanks, Jack. And, you know, if people could just learn to keep their secret underground hatches locked. That's a pretty basic rule. It's like yeah. Secret Underground 101. And once again, I'm Jack Berzini. Thank you for listening to The Secret to Stargate on StarQuest. Anyway, I'm sorry, but that just happens to be how I feel about it. What do you think?